Welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We are excited to introduce you to our speaker for tonight's program, Leading Yourself in Crisis. Nancy Kane is a historian at the Harvard Business School, where she holds the James E. Robeson Chair of Business Administration. Kane's research focuses on crisis leadership and how leaders and their teams rise to the challenges of high stakes situations. Her recent book, Forged in Crisis, The Power of Courageous Leadership in Turbulent Times, spotlights how five of history's greatest leaders successfully navigated crises and what we can each learn from their experience. Nancy, thank you for being here with us tonight. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Melissa. It's a great privilege to be here. Welcome. As Melissa said, I'm a historian. I've been at the Harvard Business School for a long time. I was at the college teaching and doing graduate work in, in history before that. And for the last almost two decades, I've been studying leaders who find themselves in the midst of absolute calamity, unexpected difficulty, chaos, uncertainty, disappointment, failure, and who find, that, find themselves in that place on a personal and then ultimately on a larger level. So I study leaders who navigate through crises internally, right? The, one of the very interesting questions of this moment is what are we each to do with all this un internal uncertainty, right? Confusion, chaos, fear, right? I study people who find themselves there and then use that very uncertainty, that very unsettling inside to get braver and better and stronger and more luminous. Um, and I've been doing this for a long time and I started doing it for just incidentally, I started doing it when my own life started falling apart, cancer, my husband walked out, my father died, my mother collapsed, I lost all my money, and I was just tenured at Harvard Business School, and I didn't know how it would go on, and I started getting interested in people who'd found themselves in even worse situations. So that's, that's where I come from. Let me say a couple of, of, of opening, offer a couple of opening appetizers, friends, um, and then I wanna tell you some stories and show you some pictures. I don't have any PowerPoint slides. Um, I have pictures and some stories. And the lessons that these, that these people learned that I think may be useful, or I offer them as possibly useful to you. So the first thing I wanna say is that, that leaders, courageous leaders, this is a, a very interesting definition of courageous leadership from a writer many of you know named David Foster Wallace. He wrote this in an article he, he published in 2000 when he was a reporter for Rolling Stone following John McCain around on his first presidential campaign. And Wallace wrote that courageous leaders are individuals who help us overcome the limitations of our own weaknesses and selfishness, our laziness and our fears, and get us to do harder, better things than we can get ourselves to do on our own. So just for a second, think about the people that have mentored you or meant something to you or inspired you or helped you develop into some, some part of you that you like. They probably fit this definition pretty well. So I'm interested in these people. And, and, and they are made, my friends, they are not born. It's not a genetic allocation. It's not something you're endowed with. You are made, you know, your nature helps you a little bit, but nurture and, and even more important, the willingness to keep getting better within yourself helps you a lot more in terms of becoming courageous. That's the first thing. The second thing I wanna offer is that crises, uncertainty, chaos, confusion, too little information, anxiety, crises, when a whole lot is changing, just like this moment, right? This massive, unprecedented, widespread crisis, a, a disease, a pandemic with a twin crisis married to it, and of this massive economic, right? Dislocation and fallout. That crises turn out to be amazing greenhouses, crucibles, if you will, petri dishes for the making of leaders, much more powerful in our making than, than stability or success or glorious victory. So that's the second thing I would offer, that people are made much more powerfully, much more influentially in crisis. And the third thing I wanna say is that I think that happens, this is at a high level, I'm gonna say a little bit more about it as we go along with a little bit more grit and detail. I think that happens because individuals decide when the stuff is really hitting the fan that they're going to raise the level of their day. So Lincoln, uh, Abraham Lincoln said in the, at a low point in the, in the Union fortunes during the Civil War, 18, end of 1862, he said, 
The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. And that's what I have learned good, good leaders do. They get made in crises because they say, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I am going to keep on in within myself getting better, navigating through that internal certainty to get better and stronger. And they do. And the, when they raise the level of their own internal game, they can re then raise the level of the game of all the people around them. So leaders are made particularly strongly in crises, right? And this is over and above. I think this is the real reason why, you know, you know, Rahm Emanuel could say during the Obama administration, you know, never waste a good crisis or Teddy Roosevelt, you know, opportunity lies in the midst of crisis. It's because people raise the level of their game and then all kinds of important things can happen from there. The last thing I want to say to you is that this is a defining moment. For many of you, this will be the defining moment for most of for most older people, like myself, this is the defining moment, as important as the Civil War or the Second World War or a host of other crises in other nations at other times have been. But why is that? It's because we are being shaped now. The word apocalypse in, in Greek means revelation, meaning all kinds of things are being revealed, being made manifest. And in that, in both the confusion and, ironically, oxymoronically, the, the clarity of this moment, we have the opportunity to do all kinds of new things and to learn and grow and redeem. So this is the defining moment. And what, or, or for many of you, the, one of the most important defining moments in your young life. If we learn the lessons of this crisis, that individual interest is completely bound up with collective interest and can apply that to climate change, this may be the defining moment of the rest of the 20th, 21st century. So what we do now with ourselves and the people around us that take our, their, their influence by us and take their cues from us is incredibly important. All right, so let me offer those as appetizers. So what will you do? How will you lead yourself in all this fear and uncertainty? And will you grow bigger, stronger, more resilient, more luminous? Or, or will the fear, as William Sloan Coffin once said, a well-known minister at Riverside Church in New York once said, will you be scared to life or scared to death? Will you get um, inexplicably, unintentionally smaller? So that's what I want to, that's the question I'm posing this, the rest of this evening's discussion around. And I'm going to, I'm going to explore that question with reference to about eight or nine insights, lessons, um, illuminations, that five leaders made in crisis with incredible impact. These were ordinary people, my friends, who did extraordinary things, who made the impossible possible. Each of these people learned, stumbled on, um, imagined and then applied these lessons, improvised them, and they turned out to be very, very valuable, first inside themselves and then for the people that they ended up influencing and in the, in the worthy mission they pursued. All right, so let me start the first story. This is a story of Ernest Shackleton. Many of you listening know this story. He was an Antarctic explorer. He was born in the late 19th century um, and, and then came of age in what was called the great uh, heroic age of polar exploration. And he tried to discover the South Pole for the United Kingdom in the early, first decade of the 20th century and failed. He didn't get there either time. He'd been there twice. And most of what he was doing on both those quests, if you will, he was part of a large number of people trying to do the same thing from different countries, was really in pursuit of something, something lots of us at Harvard understand, fame, recognition, in this case, patriotic glory as well. Uh, those eluded him, right? Someone else discovered the pole uh, after he had to turn back on an earlier expedition because his men were too weak to make the final track to the, to the South Pole. And so in 1914, what would have been his third expedition, he decides to try and travel across the Antarctic continent with a team of men, to be the first team of men to traverse the entire continent on foot. And he begins these preparations in 1913. Um, and, and this is an ad that he supposedly placed in the London Times. Men wanted for hazardous journey, low wages, bitter cold, long hours of complete darkness, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Now, it's not clear that he actually ran this ad, but what we do know, because we know a great deal about Shackleton, I know a huge amount about, is that he actually trained, he actually recruited, filtered, looked for 
people that had a certain kind of attitude, which this ad captures, right? This is not your typical, you know, monster.com ad or your typical like online recruiting um, vehicle. He was looking for people with a certain attitude. And so he wanted in a volatile, uncertain, turbulent situation, which going to the Antarctic always was, still is in many respects, um, he wanted men with a certain, a team with a certain kind of attitude. I put that up just to offer up this first insight about your life or about our lives. Who, how are we bringing people into our village, into our teams, into our support networks, uh, into our circle of colleagues? Are we doing it primarily based on what David Brooks would call resume virtues and skills and connections and you know backgrounds? Or, or are we also allowing, perhaps even giving more preference for attitudinal characteristics? I, I think in moments that where turbulence is on the rise, Attitude, hiring for attitude, bringing support people together, collecting your village based on attitude is perhaps a very, very important aspect, maybe more important, maybe more important than resume attributes. In any case, this is how Shackleton hired. He had 5,000 applicants, friends, for 27 spaces. And we have a host of pictures here of, of the expedition. So the expedition gets going in late 1914, just as war's breaking out. The First World War is, is erupting in Europe. He sails south. And um, at his last port of call in a whaling station in the South Atlantic called South Georgia, the whalers tell him that the ice is very, very far north and he's likely to encounter icebergs. And he should wait until the ice melts and warmer weather comes. And Shackleton's impatient, so after a month, he sails south nonetheless in spite of the warnings. And just as his, his expedition gets to the coast of Antarctica, the ice grabs the ship. They're about 80 miles off the coast. They can see the coastline of Antarctica in the distance. Um, and this is on the, um, on the South American side of the continent. And the ship is locked like in a vice. And, it, 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 and suddenly, for Shackleton, they can't blast their way out. Suddenly, his mission has changed massively. He has to somehow right, try and either get the ship loose, which they have no success doing, and, and failing that, which he does pretty quickly, he has to figure out how to keep his men uh, you know, united, focused, right, in, 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 in harmony, positive, grounded. So suddenly the mission is no longer, let's get to the coast, set up base camp and get walking across the continent. It's how do we keep the team, right, organized, cohesive, focused, and ready for whatever's to come next now that the ship's stuck. And, 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 and so, so that is his, if you will, his and his 27 men, men, uh, teams life for the months of January 1915 when the ship gets stuck, February, March, April. They're on the ship. They're stuck. If they're following the, t they're just stuck and following the currents in the South Atlantic near the coast of Antarctica. January uh, through June into July. It's now the winter in the southern hemisphere. In July, the ice begins attacking the ship. It's stuck between these huge, you know, vice like vice ends of ice. And the ship begins to tilt and become damaged. This is the mid, our midsummer, their midwinter. Shackleton immediately begins making plans to take the next step and move the men off the ice with the three lifeboats and the tents and as many supplies as they can cash. And that's what he does in September of 1915. The men live there. They are very anxious without their ship. They are watching their ship get battered by the ice. Here's what the ship looks like about six weeks after they abandoned ship, set up camp in tents. These are sled dogs in the foreground, completely decimated. And in mid-November of 1915, the ship in 24 hours goes through the ice and the ice closes over. And these men, 27 of them, all, almost all with some experience on the sea, not entirely because they were scientists, um, as well, and, me and medical people. The ship is gone, and the men are absolutely in shock and awe. Right? These are, they are 2,000 miles from civilization. They can see nothing but white. There's no line on the horizon. Um, and they are extremely unsettled. Shackleton himself writes in his diary, we know so much because there were diaries, he says, the endurance sank tonight, I cannot write about. That night, he paces the ice. He does a lot of pacing. So I hope we're all under, beginning to understand the mind unlocking, calm inducing benefits of walking or, mo or mo mo moving ourselves around um, our space or outside with 
protocol, social pro medical protocols. And, and he paces and he says to himself, and this is the second thing I want to offer. The first is make sure attitude and orientation toward others and chaos or uncertainty is part of your, your criteria set as you think about the people you depend on. The second one is what he says to himself that night. He says, literally talking to himself, meeting with himself, he says, a man must shape himself to a new mark the minute the old one goes aground. And what's he doing there? He's saying, I got to raise my game. I don't have a ship anymore that I can depend on. I got to get these men home alive and I have to do it with everything I've got and I have to rise. And the next morning, the men who were, could hardly crawl into the, their tents, they were so upset after the ship went down, the next morning he greets all the men with, with tea and milk, comes to their tents, opens the flap, says, men, gather around, lads. And he says to them, ship and store's gone now, we'll go home. So just for a second, my friends, think about what he was doing there and why that might be interesting to you. He was basically, he didn't know how to get them home, he knew he had, to, he had to keep on growing and getting stronger, but he's not gonna to say to his men, I have no idea what I'm doing. He's gonna walk into the moment and, and tell them what the mission now is and, and, and portray confidence and courage in the face of this real setback that they're all gonna go home. And years later, when the men came to tell the story of this, this terrible moment in the mission, they all said they couldn't believe the strength that he basically, you know gave them, projected onto them by virtue of what he did. So the second lesson I want to offer you is, are you ready to become even better, more expansive, more, more resilient, right? More open-minded, right? More able to deal with the fear. I'll say something more about that in a few minutes because fear is very, very important in this COVID-19 moment, all of our fears and the collective energy of fear that's all around us. So are you ready? to have those meetings with yourself to get better because you will not be able to take advantage for yourself, lead yourself as valiantly, as honorably, as courageously as you can, unless you say to yourself, I don't know how I'm gonna do this, but I'm gonna get better in this very, very difficult slow burn crisis. So that's the second thing I wanna offer you. So this is Shackleton's tent in early 1916. So they've now been stuck in the ice, ship went, for, for a year, ship went down about nine months in, or 11 months in. They've been on the ice in tents for, for about five months. Now this is Shackleton on the far left, my friends. Now notice how he looks. That's his first mate, his second in command, a guy named Frank Wild. And look how orderly the, 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 the camp is. He kept everyone, I wanna say something more about this a little bit later, in a strict routine. He thought routine was very important to creating stability. So there was a, a new duty roster every week, the flag, the Union Jack went up at sunrise, it went down at sunset. You know, night watch traveled around the iceberg this many times at night. All the men exercised for an hour a day by walking or running around the iceberg. This is when we shot seals to eat. This is when we cooked dinner. This is when we socialized. So everyone had a routine. And that was very, very important to keeping the men's minds focused not on the worst case scenario that they would starve to death, die of the elements, or disintegrate into such disunion, disunion that they couldn't, and they couldn't save themselves. Th that was important, right? The routine was important for warding off the worst cases. But as important as the routine, so think about your own routines and how you're creating a routine, or whether you have one that you like and can stay with, because self-discipline in all this is absolutely one of our most important tools and making that stronger and more and sharper and putting it to work for us is really important. But as important as the routine was Shackleton's presence. So look how he's standing, right? And this, this was really important. He showed up, ask yourself how you're showing up, you know, for your friends, you know, for the camera that you're sitting with in front of for your Zoom classes, for the people in your family that are looking to you to understand things they don't understand or because they're worried. How are you showing up? Showing up in service to your mission is absolutely essential. Now, we know from Shackleton's diaries, he was not always confident, right? He had lots of sleepless nights. But his men, with the exception of his confidant, Frank Wilde, with whom he shared a lot of, he could share his own emotions, his men saw him in service to his mission, as you see him in this picture. Right, got out of his tent every day, squared his shoulders, tightened his core, moved on. Right, so ask yourself lesson number three, how am I showing up in service to your mission? 
I'm a horseback rider and I took up riding very late in life, which means I have a lot of fear as the adult riders do who begin late. And one of the things I've learned working with a horse who are very, they're very intuitive is if you show up, whether you feel this way or not on a windy day, a cold day when the horse is fresh and you've had a hard day at work, if you show up anxious and nervous and, hunk and hunker down in the saddle, your horse will get anxious and nervous. So this idea of showing up in service to what you're trying to do that day with your stronger self, even if it's not the way you feel inside, is very, very important. So that was another lesson I think that's critical from Shackleton. Let me just kind of say a word about the end of the story. So they're on the ice from, from the time that they, from September of 1915, all the way until March of 1916. And they run low on food. The men get very disillusioned. Shackleton is always keeping his fingers on the pulse of the men. So he's looking to see what's bothering them, what's not. And, and in late March, 1916, the ice breaks up, the iceberg, and they take to the rowboats and they sail on an extraordinary four, four and a half, five day journey in open boats through these very rough waters to an island on the west, western archipelago of Ant the continent of Antarctica. And Shackleton quickly realizes they won't get saved there. No one will find them. They're way too far south for trading vessels. And he then takes one of those rowboats, rigs it up with a sail and a mast. It's 22 feet long. And he and five men travel northeast across huge waves and very difficult seas back to the whaling island, South Georgia, which was their last port of call. And it's an astounding journey. It's never been successfully replicated. But they did it. And then it takes Shackleton, once he reaches the whaling station, another almost five months to get a vessel that can get back through icebergs to rescue his men. But he does. Three, fourth attempt to do that. He gets them in August of 1916. All the men travel home safely. None have died of the 22 men he left there on Elephant Island, the island on the archipelago, Western Archipelago. And they all get back to Britain. And Shackleton's feat in bringing them all home alive after two years on the ice is completely eclipsed by the carnage and the erosion of individual heroism that is the First World War. Um, in 1920, late 1920, Shackleton gets the idea that that was such a delightful trip, we should all go again. And he puts the call out to all the men that, are, that he can reach, and, and more than half of them agree to go back to Antarctica in early 1921. Shackleton has a heart attack when they reach South Georgia, the port of call, and dies and is buried there. But the fact that the men would do that, come back with the boss, which was, which was their nickname for him, and, and come back for that is really quite an astounding feat. It speaks to someone who could help those men overcome the limitations of their own weaknesses, selfishness, laziness, and fears, and do harder, better things than they, can, they could have gotten themselves to do on their own. So he was an extraordinary leader, and the, the feat of making the impossible possible, of this journey when life and death were the stakes, like our moment right now, is really interesting. So think about your support team, your people in their attitude, raise the level of your game and keep on making that covenant with yourself and show up in service to your mission. This is Abraham Lincoln, a picture taken in 1854. I know I've spent 20 years with Mr. Lincoln. I never called him anything but Mr. Lincoln. Um, and I'm not gonna say very much about his complicated, fascinating, extraordinary story of self-making, which began as a young man. He was not someone who a lot of historians have attributed his, 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 his extraordinary leadership during the Civil War to what happened to him in the White House. It's a much longer story than that. This, man, this was a man who'd been trying to make himself better since he was a young man, maybe even a child, um, and who was pocked and scarred and seared by all kinds of grief and Great Depression and a host of other big obstacles that he was constantly working to overcome. Um, but that's not even the, te the tenor of this story. I want to just point out a couple of things that were very important that he stumbled on about himself that I think are useful in this particular moment and you leading yourselves, I leading myself in this age. So um, let's, So this is Lincoln in 1854. He, I love this portrait because I think he looks so handsome. He incidentally always thought of himself as ugly um, and and, and that, that's part of why he was diffident, with, often diffident, although very chivalrous with women. And he once said, just as a, an aside, he once said in the famous debates he had with Stephen Douglas during the, the Senate election in 1858 for the Senate seat from Illinois, he once said, Douglas accused him of being two-faced. 
saying one thing in one place and a different thing in another. And Lincoln said, two-faced. Do you think if I had two faces, I would ever wear this one? This is Lincoln's law. As many of you know, he was a lawyer for a long time before in and out of politics, but a lawyer uh, to support himself and his family uh, for more than 20 years in Illinois. Um, and this is a law office where he spent most of that time across from the, what was then the state capitol in Springfield. Now, in the late 1850s, here's the first lesson. Lincoln gave a lecture to a bunch of law students. And he basically said this. He said, I learned the hard way, because Lincoln started off as a very disorganized, kind of cram it in the night before the case and you know, try and fake it through the jury by telling stories and making fun of your opponent. He was a terrible lawyer to begin with. And then a mentor kind of slapped him into shape, so to speak, or brought him into shape. And, and so he, was, he became a very, very good lawyer, very good trial lawyer, very good thinker, um, and a very, very deft tactician. And he said this in this law lecture, and so I want to offer the lesson out of it. He said, look, I learned the hard way that you don't need to win. I, did, I certainly didn't need to win most of the points in a case in order to swing the jury my way. If I could win the, the, the one, two, or three, it was never more than one, two, or three cases, points on which a particular case hinged, I could bring the, the, the jury around to my way of thinking and, and, and claim the case. And, and that was an incredibly important insight that served Lincoln very, very well as president. And the lesson here, the insight here is, what are the one, two, or three things each day, each week, that only you can do that you know to be more important and on which your leadership, your impact, your mission, your sense of purpose, your ability to stay grounded and do your work well and stay right with yourself depend. It's never more than one, two, or three, ever, ever, ever. It's never even more than one, two, or three in a given week, even though our iPhones and our computers and our world would have us think it's many, our news feeds would have us think it's many more things. So Lincoln's ability to understand that saying no to the unimportant stuff, right? He could just give the rest away to his opponent. I only needed the one, two, or three things on which the case hinged. I could give the rest away. Those one, two, or three things, right? The opportunity cost of saying no to everything else was he could say yes to those things. So what are the one, two, or three things that really matter this week for you? And how, are you, and, and how can you turn away from all the cornucopia of choice around everything else and focus on those things? That focus was critical for Lincoln. So many of you know, Lincoln was elected to the presidency in 1860, a four-way race, heads to Washington. The war breaks out. The, the country splits. Uh, uh, a, a range of states in the South that form the Confederacy and succeed from the Union. And for the next, beginning in April of 1861, the country is defined by an extraordinary crisis called the Civil War, which in the end will kill or wound 1.1 million Americans on both sides of a population of about 33 million. So extraordinary carnage, even relative to the COVID crisis, extraordinary death and, 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 and casualties. Um, and the, the war proceeds, just to jump into 1863, hugely dependent for both sides on the military fortunes of the war. Lincoln, is trying everything he can to hold the Union together and to try and prosecute the war against the South. Um, and, and he talks at great length about improvising and playing, about playing every card he, ca he can in that effort. In fact, he later said of the Emancipation Proclamation that it was born of that kind of improvisation. I had to play this card. I had to try and win the war, keep France and England out of, out of the war on the side of the Union. Um, and therefore declare all slaves held in, in, in territory under Confederate rule free and free forever. And so that, that's, that's the summer or the fall of 1862. Uh, and that becomes an incredibly important act for Lincoln and the defining purpose of war, to not just save the Union, but to transform it by ending slavery. And we don't have time for me to say anything more than that. But, but I want to then fast forward. So Lincoln himself is growing, improvising, changing, Right? And then through the act of the Emancipation Proclamation, fighting a war to end slavery and ultimately offer black African-American men suffrage and citizenship. So an extraordinarily important you know, pivot for Lincoln. Uh, one other thing to say before I offer the second lesson for Mr. Lincoln. Lincoln navigated the crisis. And he said this after the, as the war was ending. He said, I, I frankly confess I had no grand plan. I navigated point to point. So let me just 
say to all of you, we're going to navigate this inside ourselves and as a country, as a city, as a university, we're going to navigate this point to point, right? We're not, there's not going to be a grand plan. There's not going to be a ways kind of, you know, route through this. We're going to navigate point to point. We're going to pivot as, it, we, as we think we're navigating through the storm and the winds are too high in this direction. We're going to change directions. We're going to learn from mistakes. We're going to learn quickly, but we're going to keep on navigating point to point. So let me please offer you the opportunity if we can all take this more and more to get more comfortable with the chaos and the uncertainty because it's part of what we have and it's part of how we're going to change you know, ourselves and, and get through the crisis and get better for it. In the, in the midsummer of 1863, a battle erupts, as many of you know, called the Battle of Gettysburg in, in Western Pennsylvania. This is the second lesson from Mr. Lincoln. Um, a host, uh, oh well, 55,000 men will be killed or wounded or missing in three days of fighting. We just don't have, we have, we're, we, we're, we have lost 42,000 people to COVID-19 deaths right now. Um, and, and so again, the carnage as terrible, terrible as it is, I lost my best friend the first week of the COVID crisis, a healthy man of 56. Um, and, and so as terrible as that carnage was, this is not the first time we have been through terrible, terrible unexpected death and destruction. At the end of that battle, this is the second lesson, Lincoln, commanding general, the Union general, George Meade, who had defeated Robert E. Lee, who, can, who was commanding the Southern forces, the Confederate forces, George Meade decides not to pursue the Confederate Army. This is a picture of the Confederate Army at the top in a grave, a mass grave dug in, in the foreground, not to pursue that army as it travels uh, south back to Virginia from, from its defeated position in Pennsylvania. And he does so because his troops are very tired. He, he telegraphs Lincoln of that decision. And Lincoln, now imagine the last email you got or the last text that made you very angry and you'll appreciate where Lincoln's coming from. Lincoln is furious. He's absolutely apoplectic because he thinks that if Meade had followed Lee, he could have crushed Lee's army and ended the war. And he writes him, imagine yourself typing the angry email reply. He writes him a very angry letter and, and he really builds up a head of steam and he just tells Lee how uh, tells me how disappointed he is and how he's just he's just prolonged the war indefinitely and how could he have done such a terrible thing and then so stay with me and then Link, Lincoln folds the letter up puts it in an envelope and writes on the back of it Abraham Lincoln to George Meade July 5th 1863 never signed never sent and puts it in his desk where it's found after he died so here's the second lesson from Lincoln in a crisis when the stakes are high and when none of us begin, begin, our, begin our days at our best because of all the chaos, it's best to slow things down in terms of your action. And when the stakes are high and your emotions are very hot tempered, do nothing. Do nothing in the heat of the moment. That's so incredibly important right now. With our loved ones, with our work, with our with our professors, with our villages, it is so very important. And we can see in many different places on powerful stages, people doing the opposite, acting quickly, acting in the heat of emotions. And we can see that very little good and most, most often damage occurs from that. I'm writing a case on the Cuban Missile Crisis for the Harvard Business School, and I'm so struck over and over getting very, very deep into this fascinating story of how very careful John F. Kennedy was not to act, even though he was a very, very anxious or very, very angry or bold not to act in the heat of the moment. So the second offering for Mr. Lincoln is do nothing when the stakes are very high and you are very, very hot under the collar. This is Lincoln in 1860. This is Lincoln in late 1863, the time he gave the Gettysburg Address. This is Lincoln in 1865, a month before he was assassinated in April. This is March of 1865. So notice how much he changes. He loses about 25 pounds. He, he said to someone at the end of the war, I'm I'm, I'm so tired right, that I don't think anyone can reach the deep down tired part of me inside. Um, nonetheless, here's the point, the lesson. Lincoln's physical stamina and his ability to feed and water himself, even if he didn't eat as much as he might have, right? His, his physical stamina, the ability to keep his own spirits, his resilience, his commitment, his emotional energy working for him was absolutely critical to the fate of the United States. I mean, if he had failed, if he had faltered, the whole history would be completely different. So, so the lesson here is to keep yourself fed and watered, not only in terms of eating well and sleeping, 
and, and exercise, but also in terms of device-free moments, right? You need at least two every day. They need to be 30 minutes or, or about that. You need to put, them, put the devices away. You need to walk or run or skip or dance or do some things that move your body because that's so good for centering your mind and getting you grounded and taking you away from the worst case scenarios. And, 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 and you need things that restore yourself. Lincoln liked to sing raunchy songs and tell dirty jokes and go to the theater and re recite Shakespeare. Whatever it is that's your restoration activity. I'm, I'm personally watching a lot of bad r romantic comedies right now and that's very centering for me because it takes my mind away. But whatever it is, you need to restore yourself. So lesson number three is feed and water yourself well. Don't forget about restoration. Let's, I want to leave time for questions. So let's move to Frederick Douglass and we'll, maybe we'll move past Monheim. Frederick Douglass, uh, abolitionist, born into slavery in 1817 or 1818, es escapes from slavery um, when he is 20 or 21, we don't know exa his exact birth date, um, and then becomes a very important abolitionist. Um, uh, beginning in the 1850s, working initially with white abolitionists and then really running his own kind of abolitionist movement with lots and lots of work with all kinds of folks like William Lloyd Garrison and um, Katie Stanton and very, very critical component of the ending of slavery. In fact, I always say Lincoln could never have ended slavery without the work that Frederick Douglass did so tirelessly between about 1845 and 1865 with politicians, African Americans, white Americans, ordinary citizens, journalists. Douglas really does more than any other single person to create the political capital Lincoln needs to make the Civil War about a war to end slavery. So Douglas is one bookend and Lincoln is the other. And the bookshelf they're on is the end of slavery. This is Douglas as a young man. Now, this is a photograph of a slave named, they called him Whip Peter, Gordon, who wandered in trying to get free to a Union camp in 1863, a Union uh, Army camp, and the photograph was taken and became a huge, was sent all over the United States in newspapers and became a very, very powerful weapon against slavery's back, which you see took so terribly scarred. So here's the first lesson from, from Frederick Douglass. Douglass is at various points as a slave and then as an abolitionist in, in physical fear. He, 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 because he escapes from slavery, because a lot of people want to kill him, he, his life is in danger quite often. It was in danger as a slave in a situation where he was whipped with scars that were like this um, many, 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 many times. That's what these, these terrible, right, if you will, indicators of, of, uh, of the oppression and injustice of slavery are. Um, they're the indications of many whippings. And, and one day he said, I discovered this is vis-a-vis -a, -vis a master, a guy named Edwin Covey, who was, that he was serving and who was beating the hell out of him. He said, I discovered that I would walk into the fear. This is the first lesson from Frederick Douglass. I would walk into the fear. Um, you know, Nelson Mandela once said that courage is not the absence of fear, it's the willingness, using almost Douglass's words, to walk into fear, to stand tall, and then discover that, you're, that you are all right. As, as, as formidable as the fear was, you were all right in the fear. And then, because you're standing there, to watch other people take a step into the fear behind you, and then to discover that the fear, if it doesn't disappear, right, dials down enormously. Courage is not the absence of fear, it's the willingness to walk into it. And what Douglas said about his willingness, and this is when he was a teenager, to, to walk into the fear and literally walk up to this overseer, this master, this slave breaker, and, and, and go to blows with him was, he said, you have seen how a, slave, how a man is made a slave, now you see how a slave is made a man. And so what Douglas was saying, first lesson, is walking into the fear and discovering that you can act and be, and, and be your strongest self in spite of the fear is to make the best of who you can be, right? To liberate yourself largely from the fear, not because you made it go away, but because you took the first step into it. So let me suggest to you that you experiment with walking into some of this fear. I don't mean literally walking into non-social distancing. I mean, in your mind and with yourself, in all the fear, which is rampant and being presented to us in the media in every way, shape, and form, that we try and experiment with walking into fear, remembering courage isn't the absence of fear. This is Frederick Douglass in 1860, when the war's about to break out. He's still fighting for abolition every which way he can. And he has seen in the deck, in 15 years of doing this, 
that largely, until the Civil War broke out, that slavery is more entrenched in the United States. So this is a person who simply, simply won't give up and is playing every single card he has to try and end slavery. And, and the lesson here is a lesson about resilience and persistence. This is Douglas about, eight, about 15 years later. So you can see that the resilience in this kind of lion-like man, right? The, 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 the conviction, the determination. So what he teaches us, I think, in this last lesson that I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, end with, and we'll, we'll, I wanna say a couple of other quick things and we'll open up for questions. What he's teaching us here is that, is that resilience is a muscle. We build it. We don't, we don't import it. We don't download it. We're not born with it. It's a muscle and we develop it. And once we find a very worthy purpose for ourselves, for our team, for the institutional organization that we're decided to commit ourselves to, right? Finding the, the commitment to that and holding on to that is empowering in itself. So Douglas, who as we, someone once said of um, Mohandas Gandhi, looks like the person he was, right? found that resilience and kept at it with extraordinary impact. So re sometimes, most of the time, a great big purpose and making the impossible possible takes a great deal of time and takes a great deal of resilience and you develop it in moments like this by persevering and not giving up. Last thing I wanna say about Douglas and then I wanna uh, just kind of say, say a couple of things before we turn to questions. Last thing to say about Mr. Douglas is he understood something that's very, very important. And you're seeing if you're watching some of these governors that are emerging as so, you know, making themselves into such good leaders. I mean, if you're watching Gretchen Whitmer or, or if you're watching Jacinda Ardern, the prime minister of New Zealand, or if you're watching Andrew Cuomo, some of these leaders are just really, Larry Hogan in Maryland, really just getting better every day. You know, they are discovering that once you find the purpose, your goal, your North Star that you're steering to right now, you get, you get very stubborn about sticking to that, and you get very flexible in a crisis about how you get to that. So this is a moment all about flexibility. It's not about flexibility in relation to what you're trying to do that's good. That you, 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 you glue yourself to, you Velcro yourself to, but you get very supple, this combination of suppleness and, and stubbornness uh, in, in, in a crisis. Let's, let me pause here. We have about 15 minutes for questions, and I'm going to say a few things here to you about some, I think, some larger, perhaps larger lessons. But let's pause here and see if we have some questions or comments. Hi, Nancy. We have a couple of folks who are wondering if you could share a few examples of women leaders who have courageously navigated crises. I'd love to. I'm so glad you asked. So let me say a word about Rachel Carson. I'm writing a case now about Greta Thunberg, who is the youngest leader I've ever written about. Many of you know her. She's a kindred spirit of Rachel Carson. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I've written about Marion Wright Edelman. I'm, I wrote a case about Madam Walker, if you know the first black African-American millionaire, self-made millionaire who became a force for social progress. So yes, yes. So let me just say a word about Rachel, who I know very, very well. She was the, more than any other single person, my friends, the founder of the modern environmental movement. She was a scientist and a writer. She was born in the early 20th century and she wrote best-selling books about nature because she was a trained marine biologist when women didn't go to college, much less become trained women biologists. She spent a lot of her career working for the government in the Fish and Wildlife Service as an editor and, uh, as a, and also as a, uh, an author uh, on her own. And in the late 1950s, she gets interested in DDT, which is an extraordinary um, a very, very commercially successful, had been successful during the Second War chemical pesticide that turns out to be quite dangerous to wildlife, drinking water, air, and human health. Um, and she begins research on this um, in a book, for a book that will eventually become a book called Silent Spring. And in 1960, about midway through the research, she develops breast cancer, metastasizing aggressive breast cancer. And so the, the, the early 1960s are a race against the clock to finish her book, um, which she does and publishes it. And it becomes, I, I, I think, the most important book written in English in the 20th century. Lots of people would corroborate that. Every major environmentalist today, including Greta Thunberg, Al Gore, E.O. Wilson, will tell you, Bill McKibben will tell you, that they owe more to her than they did any other single leader in their lives. Um, and so she, working alone with great, 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 
uh, threats against her by chemical companies in the US, uh, US Department of Agriculture uh, accomplishes the impossible. And here's the, here's the kicker to the question, this very good question. I think one of the kickers is not just her courage, not just her ability to fight a disease that would ultimately kill her um, and, and to do it while she's writing this book and to do it so bravely and so quietly, she told no one she had the disease because she didn't want people to think she was in a vendetta against the chemical companies. Here's the kicker. Um, she found the power of her purpose, right? the power of, as she said, I could never keep silent if you knew what I knew. But the most important thing is that she was, I think, was that she was shy. She was an introvert. She was generous. She was kind. She was quiet. She wrote everything herself. She was more at home on the main beaches than clucking with her heels, clicking down the quarters of marble floors in Washington. She was the opposite of what a lot of people think of as courageous leaders. She wasn't charismatic. She wasn't aggressive. She wasn't hard charging. She was a woman in a man's world and she changed the world in extraordinary ways. And she did it by writing and she did it by uh, integrity and she did it by finding courage in the face of fear walking into all that fear every day um, so here's the lesson my friends the lesson is not just the power of a mighty purpose to keep you going when everything is stacked against you the real I think transcendent lesson of Rachel Carson and is that and this is true for many leaders particularly for women leaders is that courageous leaders who change the world for the better come in every shape and size including, as so obvious in her face here, the ability to be a great and nurturing caretaker. Questions, comments? So you've talked about a lot of different lessons and different leaders. Um, what kind of leader does this current crisis need? I think we need a leader very much like at, the, at a large level, someone who's capable of continually raising their game, helping other people push through those boundaries to get do better, harder things. We need someone who's presenting both brutal honesty, always right, twinned with, you know, connected to credible hope. We need someone who can improvise and experiment, you know, who, who can tell the truth and trust the emerging, right, the facts as they are emerging, because this is all so new, this disease. And what its, you know, what its infection rate is and what its antibodies are like and how it can be treated and how it can be vaccinated against and what the real like underlying incidence and mortality rates. It's all so new that we have to keep on, right, le learning forward as we go. So we need someone who can handle all that. Right? Convene those people, deal with the facts, keep on pivoting, do all these things that we're talking about, and still right, help people access their stronger selves. Paint a picture not only of this moment and when we're going to reopen, everyone's question, or you know, how we're going to test, but also what the next chapter is like and what the next chapter is like, because this isn't going to end in June. And do that in a way that helps people trust call forth their stronger side and be part of the solution and not just those extraordinary people who are making all of our lives possible all those essential workers in healthcare, food production truck delivery you know etc sanitation bus drivers so we need someone that can do all those things and keep on growing and and as important as all that we're starting to see that with some of the governors talk about what we need to learn and change so we get better from this terrible crisis and those people are out there. I'm very optimistic, I'm, I'm quite optimistic. If we aren't ourselves in a place of formal leadership, how do we practice doing nothing in the heat of the moment if our managers or leaders are pushing for productivity? By just taking a yoga breath and deciding, let's, let's put that together with the focus by possibility. These are the one, two or three things that are most important. Sometimes the, thing, the, the most important thing that leaders in all shapes and sizes do is, is manage or lead up, help people in, in positions with more author organizational authority than we have, understand why something is more important than something else. Why, necessarily, why acting necessarily quickly might not be the best course. I mean, just think about what Andrew Cuomo is doing in New York. All he's doing the last five days of press conferences, which I never miss because I'm watching him evolve, is say, we're not going to move precipitously on reopening. We're not going to do that. Lives are at stake. We're going to do it thoughtfully, and we're going to do it carefully, and we're going to do it. But, but 
all he's doing exactly that. He is slowing everything down when there are a lot of political pressures and a lot of economic pressures to speed up. But when the stakes are life and death, you have to be very, very thoughtful. So, so you have to lead up, you have to manage up and help people understand that the fastest course, as important as urgency is, it isn't necessarily the best course. And think it through, one, two, or three things. What do we need to be focused on? Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, let me say a couple of things in closing here. Um, first, uh, you know, I was a member of Memorial, I'm a member of Memorial Church. I was been a member of Memorial Church for a long, long time. We had a minister here uh, when I first joined the church in 2003 named Peter Gomes. Some of you on this, on this webinar will know him or know of him. And he said something really interesting after September 11th. I wasn't in the congregation then, but I read this sermon that he wrote. Let me read it to you. And this is the first thing I want to offer you as a kind of th three-part benediction, if you will, or closing takeaways. He said, when in the midst of turmoil and calamity, you seek the inner strength, right? Outer turmoil, inner strength. You seek the inner strength that helps you not only to endure, but to overcome. Do not look for what you can get. Look rather for what you have been given and what you can give, right? So do not look necessarily for what we can get or what we, just what we need or what we want. Let's look for what we can give, because here's the thing I'm, I've learned through all these different leaders that I've studied. I'm a biographer. I study the inside of people who make good, worthy, decent impact. And what I have learned is all those people ultimately cross the bridge, which is a bridge from one form of power to a much more, much more enduring form of power from I and my agenda to how I can serve and give to a larger collective, to we, from I to we, from I to thou, as the German theologian Martin Buber once said. So let me just say first, think about what we owe to people more vulnerable than we. That's a very empowering direction for our thoughts and our actions. And we all have room to act on that to some extent, even confined to quarters. So that's the first thing. Second thing, self-discipline. This is a, you know, Rachel Carson said at the end of her book, when she was interviewed on a very popular a news show, she said, um, we do not master nature, we master ourselves. Edmund Hillary, the famous mountaineer said, we do not master the mountain, right? We master ourselves. So how can we in this moment, in all this uncertainty, find the self-discipline to be more forgiving, to get more resilient, to help quiet someone else's fear, which will help quiet us, to help quiet ours, to be more luminous, to be more expansive, to put ourselves in some place where we are of more service and find the power in that place. So that's about self-discipline. So the second thing I would say is, you're all disciplined on this call, or you wouldn't be on this call in terms of like where you are, right, in relation to Harvard. But more self-discipline, right, in service to making yourself better is extremely valuable. And the last thing I'll say is that um, purpose. I teach a course at Harvard Business School on Authentic Leadership, and we spend a great deal of time throughout the course helping people find an animating purpose. Not necessarily a life purpose, because we will have different North Stars to steer by in our lives, many of us. Frederick Douglass only had one, but we'll, many of us will have many. And, but they'll all be important, and they'll take us in a transcendent direction if we, once we stumble into it. So this is, crises are great times to stumble into your purpose because there's so much good to be done, so many problems to be solved, so many people to help. So let me just encourage you to open up your eyes in the midst of all the other things you're doing and all the stuff coming at you and think about, is my purpose here somewhere for now? And, and how do I steer to that? I have seen people grow by leaps and bounds when they find their purpose in extraordinary ways. So let me just encourage you that, to, 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 to look for that in the midst of everything else. And last but not least, the world needs you. Leaders come in all shapes and sizes. Greta Thunberg. This, the coming out of this crisis is going to depend on a whole new group of young leaders in a way it never has before. So when you're ready, get in the game. We need you. Thank you for sharing with us tonight, Nancy. I think we're all leaving with some wonderful insights. And thank you all for participating. Nancy is going to work with us to formulate some takeaways that we can share out with you after. Thanks again, and thank you all for being here. Good night.